All right, everybody. Um, for those of you who are watching this later, my name is Scott McCormick, and this is the Cartersville First Baptist Church men's group. We've been studying the, the Gospel of John, and we have made it into John chapter 3. Let's see, my name's Mr. Scott. We're in John chapter 3, and before we dive in and see and continue on this journey, I want us to reread again the entire conversation that a man named Nicodemus is having with a man named Jesus. Nicodemus um, gets a pretty bad rap, but as we study his who he is in this passage, and then there's further passages where he keeps popping up in the Gospel of John, we see a man who has spent his whole life um, trying to be a good person, coming to Christ and to talk to him about these things and being stunned by what he learns. And as Jesus continues his ministry, Nicodemus becomes a devoted follower of Christ. So we're studying these first 21 verses of John chapter 3, and I'd like for us to reread that before we zero in on what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to go in order of how you guys are, are lined up on my screen. Uh, so Ben, if you will read for us John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Verses 1 through 8. Uh, Mike, if, you yeah. read, if you'll read for us verses 9 through 15 of John chapter 3. And Pete, if you'll read for us, please, verses 16 through 21. All right, you ready? Everybody ready? Let's do it. All right. There, there was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. Jesus replied, I assure you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But how can anyone be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked him, can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear it sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony? If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believed in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Very good. So if y'all will uh, pause for me a second. My dad's trying to connect and let me get him. All right, thank you guys for reading that. So let's let's review a little bit. There's there's two main characters here in this conversation, and it's likely that the disciples are standing around listening to this conversation. But our two main characters here are Jesus, who Nicodemus came to see at night, 
and Nicodemus. And what do we remember about Nicodemus? He's a Pharisee. He's a Pharisee. He is an expert in the law. He is uh, the teacher of Israel. He is a rabbi. And he's come to Jesus at night, likely because Jesus has been crowded all the time during the day, and he wants this intimate conversation where they can be serious and talk about things. Um, sometimes people say, man, he was timid and he was worried about what other people were thinking. That's also possible. Uh, but regardless, he comes to Jesus at night to have this conversation, and Jesus immediately turns the conversation on its head. And, and in response to some of the opening statements that Nicodemus gives, he comes out right out of the box with one of these truly, truly statements. Now, who remembers, why does he repeat this word? Truly, truly. What does that mean when he does it that way? Repetition creates emphasis. That's right. It's an emphasis. It's a, this is a Hebrew way of raising the, the level of something. So we, we studied in the book of Isaiah, when Isaiah was called, Isaiah was given a vision of the throne room of heaven and heard the angels around the throne singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, that, that the holiness of God was raised up to that third level. Here, Jesus is declaring some hardcore basic principles of what we would call Oh, this is a big theological word. Soter, I'm, gonna, I'm even going to spell it wrong. Soteriology. Ology. Soteriology. This is the things we believe about salvation. That's what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about salvation. And this first truly, truly statement here is that you must be born again. Born again. The Greek there can also be interpreted born from above. Both are good interpretations of that phrase. Both tell us different things about what he's saying. It's a second birth. It's also a supernatural birth or, and a spiritual birth, a birth that comes down. And Nicodemus is a little taken aback. He doesn't understand. What is his problem with that first statement? What does he say in response that belies why he has trouble with this? <clears throat> I, he, he says, can a man go back in his mother's womb? But I, I think that his issue is, you know, the Pharisees, they're so much about do this, do this, do this, mm -hmm. have this many tassels on your robe, take this many steps on Sunday. It's all stuff that they do, you know, and this is something that he can't do himself. So I think that that's what throws him for the loop. That's exactly right. Yeah. It's almost he, like he, principles. Like That's right. Uh, he, he's like been, a principle, like basic truth and law. Yeah. Go ahead, say it. I, I keep jumping in on you. Well, I was, no, you're fine. I was just saying it's like it's like when I taught sociology and psychology. So you know, essentially, what a principle is, PLE, is a basic truth or law. And so he needs to understand this is the basic truth. Here is a law, and I abide by this. Like Ben said, I don't take extra steps. It's straight A to B. And he's like, this doesn't make any sense. How can you we put them back in the mother's womb that kind of threw me off when i read that earlier too it's yeah it's not feasible but yeah, I think exactly he's that because it doesn't make sense right and so uh jesus is saying unless one is born again he cannot see the kingdom of heaven there's a problem that we have before the new birth that is spiritual blindness that if somebody comes to us and says look here's the gospel here's the way to god here's the way to heaven and we're spiritually blinded in our sin it doesn't make any sense to us. It's sort of like describing color to a blind man. It doesn't make any sense. Like, you, you can't get there from here. So the Holy Spirit has to, has to regenerate us. That's another big uh, theological word there. This whole conversation is about regeneration. This is taking the heart of stone that's within us and making it a heart of flesh. This is taking uh, hearts that are totally depraved by sin and making them new again, putting on the new man. So we're in spiritual blindness, but there's also an issue here that he reiterates in verse 5, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So there is a spiritual inability here. Cannot enter. 
And he, he sort of repeats the same word that Nicodemus tries to use in his word picture. How, how can a man be born again? Can he enter again into his mother's womb? And here Jesus then follows up and says, unless you're born of the water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Uh, he turns it right back around on him. And so last week, as we studied this, we were talking about that section, that paragraph there, verses five through eight, and where Jesus is painting some pictures uh, and using a picture with the wind. Now he does a little play on words. We'll do a little review on that before we get, we're going to get into that paragraph after this in just a second. But the word spirit in Greek, who remembers what the word spirit is in Greek? Huh? Nobody? It's the word pneuma. Pneuma. It, it sort of has this like breathy sound to it. Pneuma. Okay? It's similar in Hebrew. It's the ruch. It has this, it's like you've got to breathe out of your mouth to even make the sound. It's an onomatopoeia. This word spirit is pneuma. Pneuma is also the word for wind in Greek. And so he makes a play on words here to draw a picture as to how this new birth in the spirit actually works. He says in verse seven, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. So he's, he's playing off of two components to the wind that, that he wants to draw parallels to the operations of the spirit. One is that you, you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So if you're to go outside, and even if you were an expert meteorologist and it's a windy day, you're not gonna be able to look up and say, well, that's where the wind comes from. And that over there, that's where it's going. I mean, you, you may understand that wind is caused by temperature differences in the atmosphere and prefer, uh, pressure differentials at different altitudes, and that causes wind but it's still an incomprehensible thing. Here's the wind flowing by you. You can tell it's blowing, but you don't know where it's going. So there's something about it that is incomprehensible. But there's also something about it in, in, in that you aren't in control of it. Somebody else is, and that's God. It's also sovereign. He's pointing to the incomprehensible nature of the spirit and also to the sovereign nature. I'm just going to erase the whole word. Sovereign nature of the spirit. The spirit is a person with a will, a person, a member of the Trinity. He comes and goes as he pleases. He enters a man heart, a man's heart and regenerates him according to his will. And, and so he's trying to tell Nicodemus, look, two things based on what we know about the wind. I'm, I'm going to make a picture here, a word picture for you. You don't have to know everything about how this works for you to accept it. It can be that there are so many things about God that are not even captured in this book because we couldn't understand them with our finite minds anyway. God is infinite and we are finite. And so the incomprehensibility about God doesn't mean we can't know him, know of him, know about him, but it does mean we can't wrap our minds completely around him that would make us God, and, and that's, that just doesn't work. Like, uh, I'm, I'm six feet tall, and that's it. God is everywhere. I'm only so smart, and I'll be real honest, I'm getting dumber every day uh, as the older I get. But God is wisdom incarnate. Everything that he knows is all there is to know about anything. So that's one thing, and the other is, Look, God is sovereign in all of this. You've been working so hard to achieve something that you cannot achieve. This is up to God, and you need to rely on him for this. So Nicodemus then in verse 9, we're going to pick up now where we left off last week. Nicodemus in verse 9 says, how can these things be? And so when he started this conversation, he comes to Jesus, and he, he's kind of got this frown on his face with question marks going, I don't get it. I mean, can a man enter? Can, can he enter into his mother's womb? Like, this is not matching up with how I understand things to be. And now that Jesus continues this conversation, this frown kind of turns into like a, like a wow face. Like, wow, huh? seriously? That's, that's, that's how this works? 
how come I didn't know this? How come, how come I'm just now hearing about this? So Jesus responds to his amazement with another truly, truly statement. Now he's already given us one when he said, one is, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Then he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And here's our third one in this conversation. In verse 10, Jesus answers him, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness of what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Now, he, he, um, he, first of all, he calls Nicodemus something. He uses this phrase, teacher of Israel. At the, at the top of the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin is the ruling body of the Jewish community. At the top of the Sanhedrin, there were three positions of importance. They were sort of a mixture of political and educational and spiritual leadership. One of those was his primary role was to be the teacher of Israel. He, he was a, he, he was, his job was to uh, exposit scripture. His job was to take what was known and understood from the Old Testament scriptures and teach it to the people. And here Jesus is referring to Nicodemus in this way. Now we don't have like confirmation that that was his role, but it's possible that that's who he was. This is not a guy at the bottom of the, the group called the Pharisees. He's not a, a member in the shadows or on the sidelines. When they have their Pharisee meetings, he's not a wallflower. This is a guy who's out front leading the way. And he says, you're in that position as a guy who knows that much about scripture and you don't understand these things. What he's trying to tell him is that all of this stuff that you're supposed to, that I've been talking about is all captured in the Old Testament. That, that this idea of the new birth is something you should already know about. The workings of the spirit is something that you should already know about. And so he says, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. So he uses this third person, no, I'm sorry, first person plural, we. And this is another one of those times, like <laughs> if you turn back a page, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus, he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. Well, it's just Nicodemus that's come to Jesus, and he's using first person plural. We know that you're a teacher. And if you come, if you come up to my wife and say, we, she'll look at you and say, what, is there a rat in your pocket? Like, what, what are you talking about? What's, what's this we business? And here Jesus pulls the same stunt. Who is he talking about when he says we? Because the, the verse right after this, he goes back to first person singular. He says, I. And I read multiple commentators this week on this. And every one of them had an opinion. And they were all different. You know, is he talking about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit here? Is he talking about we, meaning the Trinity? Does he mean me and the disciples? Does he mean uh, Jesus and John the Baptist, who we've been studying about in chapter one, and he'll come up again later in chapter three? Does he mean Jesus is saying we in the royal sense? Like, we must go do this, meaning you must go do this, really. But that's usually what it means. The royal we, you know, it's plural, but really I'm talking about you. Um, but that doesn't make sense either. So like the point that I want to make here is that we don't know. He doesn't say. It doesn't say, here's what I'm talking about when I say we. And then he switches straight back to first person. But that's okay. The point here that he's trying to make is that we've been speaking to you about this and bearing testimony. There's that word, testimony. I'll write that up here. This is that legal term that we used about John the Baptist. Testimony. This is, this is sort of like you went into a court of law and they said, place your hand on the Bible and repeat after me. 
and you raise your right hand and say, you know, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. This is a testimony. So here he's using that same word, testimony. We bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. It's not received. Do not, you do not receive our testimony. And then, and then he says, <coughs> and what, what, he's, what he's sort of taken uh, issue with here is that testimony is accepted based on the authority of the person who's giving it. Generally, that's how that works. If someone is not uh, an authoritative witness, if, if there's a crime that's happened, you, you want to see, you want to talk to an eyewitness of the crime. If there is a, a subject within the court of law that comes up that you need an expert to come weigh in on, you got to bring in somebody that knows about these things to give testimony, to, to, to bear witness about what's true in that case. Uh, my, my mom has worked with an old friend of hers. She's a nurse, but she gives legal counsel in court cases for medical things. She goes into the court, makes a case based on medical knowledge so that the jurors can make a decision. That's a similar example of that. And so here he says, we've been bearing witness to you, and yet you do not receive our testimony. You are rejecting the authority that we have on this subject, even though you came to me to ask this question. So he follows that up in verse 12. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things. So what earthly things has he been telling Nicodemus about? <clears throat> do you think, do you think Nicodemus was there when he was cleansing the temple? In, in... Uh, it's possible Nicodemus saw it. Yeah. <clears throat> so that maybe he's talking about his father's house and cleaning up his house and that kind of stuff. That's yeah. possible that he was there for the cleansing. Sure. <clears throat> yeah. Asking him what he is, he's told in this conversation with Nicodemus. I think it's in this conversation. Okay. Yeah. So like what in this conversation, really, you could just like read back what in this conversation that he's talked to him about, what do you think he's referring to when he says earthly things? Clearly he means some of what I just told you is earthly things. Well, I the would, wind blowing back and forth. Yeah, there's, we've got the example of the wind and the comparison of that to the spirit. There's also this subject of regeneration. In other words, this is something that happens to men and women. This is something that happens to humans on this earth. The spirit comes down and does this to you. This is an earthly thing. This is something that should be an everyday, commonplace, understandable thing for you as the teacher of, of Israel. And um, he says, but if, if you don't believe that, what if I told you about what worship services in heaven looked like? What if I told you about the streets of gold? What if I told you about the many rooms in my father's house? What if I told you about the inner council of the Trinity as they talk back and forth to each other? We can't even begin to get close to that stuff if we can't get over this stuff. These are earthly things. Uh, I'm going to teach you about heavenly things, but, but you, if you reject this, how can you believe that? He's, he's making a, a dichotomy there. And so he says, if you, if you don't believe this, and so as a result, we can't even get to that, let's talk about why you don't trust my authority. Let's see. Dad, you've popped in, by the way. Hey, Paul. Ah. Um, can you reread for me verse 13 of John chapter 3? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended fr from heaven, the Son of Man. Very good. Now, there's a, there's, that's a rich verse right there. But what he's talking about there is about authoritative witness. If, if Nicodemus's problem with believing what he's saying is that he doesn't trust his authority, he says, you know, if, if, if you don't believe me when I tell you earthly things, what if I tell you of heavenly things? 
Well, let's talk about my authority on that. It, it was a common um, axiom in those days that for a man to be trusted on a particular subject, he needed to have been there to actually see it on the spot. We're looking at an eyewitness. This is, we would call this an eyewitness testimony. In order for you to actually be an authority on what happened, you needed to be there on the spot. Well, what is Jesus's authority on heavenly things? He says, no one has ascended to heaven. In other words, nobody that you've ever talked to has actually been in heaven and then come down to share these things with you. Now, there are men who were prophets that were, that were given things to speak by God. They were granted authority, and their authority was displayed by the miracles that he allowed them to perform to prove that he had actually sent them. This is why when Nicodemus comes to Jesus, he says, uh, I know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So that's one example of that. But here Jesus is claiming something even higher than that. And so if you'll forgive me for drawing heaven like a cloud up here, okay, that's heaven. That's not really heaven. I can't draw what heaven actually looks like. He says, no man has actually ascended so as to actually have come down and bear witness about what's in heaven, except for one man. And who is that? What does he say? Son of man. The son of Amen. man. Now, this is Jesus' favorite name for himself. This is, this is pointing back to a phrase used in the book of Daniel, the son of man. And usually when Jesus refers to himself, oftentimes he calls himself the son of man. Now, in many, in many manuscripts, when I say manuscripts, I mean like source texts written in Greek and Hebrew, the stuff that we translate our English Bible out of, in many manuscripts, you'll see that, that verse continue. It says, the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Now, uh, I've got a footnote on mine that says that. There's like a little uh, footnote number six, and at the bottom it says that in the King James, I think it actually includes that phrase there in the verse. And I wanted to point out here that if it does actually say that here, this is in present tense. Jesus is standing in front of Nicodemus when he makes this comment. And he's referring to himself as the Son of Man. No man has ascended to heaven except he who descended from heaven, which is the Son of Man, which is in heaven, present tense. Why is that true? I mean, if he's standing in front of Nicodemus, why is it saying that he is in heaven? I think some, some might say that he himself is an embodiment of heaven. Like, I don't know if that makes sense. Like, he is heaven come to earth for this time period. Okay. okay. <clears throat> is it that he's consubstantial with the other persons of the trinity oh man wow that's a big word there luke can you give us can you give us a no, language that was, definition that was, chad. that was that was chad not luke that was chad oh sorry chad i it highlighted luke's friends but it was cut off and all it said was luke i apologize yeah, Cons no, I, I'm luke. <laughs> say, say what I, I am luke you oh i forgot about that yeah you're you are luke okay consubstantial with the Trinity. Now, can you give us a layman's definition? Um, consubstantial, how would I describe it? Christ, well, the Logos, or the Word, the Spirit, and the Father, they're all God in this thing called the hypostatic union. Um, they are the same substance while Bingo. still being different. Bingo. They're the same substance, but they're different. That's perfect. Look at, look at this root word here, consubstantial. You'll see the word substance in there. They are of the same thing. That When we talk about the Trinity, they are one and yet three. 
This is true. And so in that sense, Jesus is also in heaven because the rest of God is in heaven. But the thing that I want us, this is true, and I'm glad you brought it up. But the thing that I want us to note here is that when we talk about Jesus, oftentimes we'll use this phrase, that he is fully God and fully man. In other words, when Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us, he did not leave heaven to do so, even though we do have songs that, that use that phrase, okay? You know, um, but he remained in heaven in that he's still God. And one of the things we know about God is that he is omnipresent. So there is the God part of Jesus that is omnipresent, even though the man part of Jesus, this is hard for us to wrap our minds around because he's both at the same time without mixing the two together. In other words, Jesus as a man was not omnipresent. His physical body was always in just one place. But as God, he was omnipresent. Another example of this is his omniscience. He knows all things, but as a man, he can't know all things. So there are things that Jesus was able to know supernaturally that were part of the Spirit revealing things to his flesh that he as God actually did know because he was omniscient. This is really hard for, this is hard for me to get. But I wanted us to note here is that just because Jesus be, was born as a baby does not mean that the, the eternal Logos was no longer on the throne in heaven. He was still there. And so, um, so that he's kind of sneaking that in here to this conversation, the Son of Man which is in heaven. Um, not all manus manuscripts include that phrase, and yet it is a true phrase that we know from what we know about Jesus. So I wanted us to, to go ahead and point that out. Does that make sense? I'll pause there for questions because that's a, this is sort of like a woe thing. And I, I just want to see if you guys want to ask about that. Do you mind tying that back to your original question? In other words, you don't have to give the whole explanation. But what was the original question you asked before it was answered with consubstantial? Um, the question was, what does he mean by, you know, if, if the Son of Man, I can't write it all today, Son of Man, he calls himself the Son of Man, and he's standing in front of Nicodemus, and he's referring to himself, but then he says, which is in heaven. So in other words, he's referring to himself, but he's also saying that he's also in heaven, that he's also standing in front of Nicodemus. So how is that possible? Is, is that true? What is he saying when he says that? And so it's referring to the fact that he is fully God and fully man, and Jesus, fully God, is still in heaven. He's omnipresent. Okay, thank you. Cool. Any other questions? All right, then we will continue. Now, we're going to get to, this is the part that's going to point back to some Old Testament scriptures that we're going to go explore together. Now, he follows this up. He says, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. In verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, this is a reference to um, a, a, a tiny bit of Old Testament scripture that we don't really know that that's pointing to Christ until he mentions it right here in this text, in this conversation with Nicodemus. He's drawing a parallel, an analogy, to an event in Israelite history during the exodus from Egypt on the way to the promised land that happened in the book of Numbers. So keep a finger in John and turn with me to Numbers chapter 21. Uh, Numbers. Numbers chapter 21. Now, a little bit of background. 
in the book of Numbers around chapter 21. If you were to flip back like a page or two, depending on how thick your Bible is, in chapter 20 is when Moses, God tells Moses to take the staff and then go speak to the rock and command the rock to, to put forth water uh, to, for the Israelites to drink. And Moses decides to be a show off and take a little glory for himself in that moment. And he strikes the rock and then God, and, and water still comes out, but God goes, look, you were trying to glorify yourself instead of me. And the punishment for that is that you're not going to get to enter the promised land. So not that long after that happens, we get what happens in chapter 21. So the Israelites are continuing to move amongst the people of um, Canaan. They're they're defeating some. They're avoiding others. They're going around mountains. They're on the way. And let's see, Dad, you haven't gotten, oh, you did get to read. Let's see, who else is on here? Uh, Luke's friends. Can one of you read um, verses, uh, we're in Numbers 21. Verse 4 through 6. Okay, I'm going to read 4 through 6, but this comes from one of those, it comes from the Septuagint, so I'm not sure if the numbers are the same. Well, you get as close as you can, and that'll be fine. Okay, well, it starts off, and they marched off from Mount Hor by the way that leadeth to the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the people began to be weary of their journey and labor. In speaking against God and Moses, they said, Why didst thou bring us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, nor have we any waters. Our soul now loatheth this very light food. Wherefore the Lord sent among the people fiery serpents, which bit them and killed many of them. Very good. So here they are... uh, they're going around the land of Edom. They, they, they don't want to go through Edom. They're going around the land of Edom. And I'm going to draw lots of people here. These are the Israelites. Um, and they're traveling in a large group. And they are impatient to get to where they need to go. And they begin to bicker and complain and moan and groan. And we, we give the Israelites a really bad rap for being whiners. And all you've got to do, by the way, is turn on Facebook and find out that all of us are whiners too. So this is a picture of us. And God's response to this is to send among them fear, fiery serpents. And so here's my, here's my fiery serpents um, with, with tongues. Like these are bad. I need to practice my snake drawings. So um, they come amongst the people. I'll draw them with bigger mouths. That'll look better. And they come and they bite the people and they die. This is a, this is a plague. This is a punishment. This is, this is sent to wake the people up. They're, they are literally dying because they were whining about God's provision for their life. So in verse 7, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. They got the picture. We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you, talking about Moses. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And in verse 8, the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Now, did God actually take away the serpents? Dad's shaking his head no. He did not take away the serpents. He left the serpents. Let me me draw that back. He left the serpents to continue to bite the people who were whining and complaining against him. But he he made a way for them not to die. What was that way? The snake on a stick. Yep. A snake on a stick. So here's the stick. 
And here's this snake, like that. And to be into, even if you got bitten, if you looked to it, you would not die. Now, there are some very clear parallels that Jesus is drawing to himself. He said, as if, flip with me back to John chapter 3. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the, the Son of Man be lifted up. So as the serpent was put on a pole, what would Jesus be put on instead? Cross. The cross. That these two right here, I'm going to draw all these, these whiny, I'm going to erase the whiny Israelites. He's making a parallel between the snake on a stick and Jesus on the cross. So in as much as the snake is lifted up, so would Jesus be lifted up. And in as much as you look to that snake on a pole for your, for your temporal, for your medical, for your earthly salvation, so looking to Jesus on the cross, when you look to, the, to him, it's for your eternal salvation, for your spiritual salvation. But even more than that, what did Moses put on the pole? Did he put a fancy theological symbol? Did he put, um, you know, did he put a fish? You know, did he put uh, a, a dove? Did he put, what did he put on the pole? But this isn't a trick question. This is like literally what did he put on the pole? Snake. He put a snake on the pole. The snake spit the people. And he put something that was a likeness of the snake on the pole. The snakes are full of venom. They're biting the people. That's where the poison is. He's putting something that looks like the snake on the pole. And when Jesus was lifted up onto the cross, he was made into the likeness of sin. All of the sins of all who would ever believe on him were placed on him. On the cross, he was treated as a sinner just like the snake on the pole was as though it were poisonous. It's not. It's in the likeness of a snake. Jesus is in the likeness of sin, and that's what, when we look to him, we are saved. There, there are direct parallels here that Jesus is making, that, um, but he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, that he was counted as though he were a sinner, that all of the sins of all who would ever believe on, on his name were placed on him and punished in him on the cross. And that's the parallel that we see of this snake on a pole. Now there's one more word that I want us to catch before we break for today. That's this word, must. He says, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. This is, this is a necessary thing. This must happen. This isn't a should happen. This isn't a will happen or can happen. No, no. It's going to happen because it must happen. This is not the first time that we see this, and it's not the last time that we see this. Turn with me this is at the very early in Jesus' earthly ministry. This is right there at the beginning as he's gathering disciples. This is at the first Passover that he makes this claim, must. Turn with me to Luke chapter 24. Luke is right before John, and 24 is the last chapter in Luke. Let me make sure. Yes, it's the last chapter in Luke. And I want us to read a couple of passages here. In Luke 24... Verses 25 through 27, Jesus responds to a conversation that he has post-resurrection. He is raised from the grave, and he kind of sneaks up alongside some of his old disciples as they're walking down the road to Emmaus, and they don't recognize him. I mean, how, how could they? He was dead, and, and, and now he's alive. He's in his resurrected body. He sort of hides his identity, and they begin to describe to him all the things that have happened to Jesus, and they're sad about it. And in verse 25, he responds and says to them, 
O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The prophets and Moses, which is a way to sort of bookend all of the Old Testament scriptures, pointed to Christ and who he was and who he needed to be and what he was going to do. This was a necessary thing. He says, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things? Now, like literally on the same page in my Bible, we're still in Luke chapter 24, um, starting at verse 36, Jesus appears to a larger group of disciples in a locked room. He just suddenly appears to them, and they're frightened. They let him feel his hands and feet and touch him. They give him some food, and he eats it to prove that he really is raised from the grave. This is not a ghost that they're seeing. And in verse 44 of Luke chapter 24, verse 44, he says to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Must be fulfilled. This had to happen. And then I love verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Guys, when we are born, we are in spiritual darkness. Our, our, our minds and our eyes are blinded to spiritual things. The Holy Spirit has to open our eyes and our minds to understand the word of God. If, if he does not, we won't. Because we are only able to understand fleshly things, not spiritual things. He continues and says, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Not only must this happen, the end result is the salvation and good news for all men. You need to take this out starting in Jerusalem and go and proclaim it. Now, why do I focus on this must? This is a necessary and exclusive claim to the process of salvation. That repentance and forgiveness of sins is only available by the work that Christ did, and that it had to happen that way. I went to Mercer University. That's where I went to college. And the president of the school at the time when I was there, uh, Kirby Godsey, wrote a book. And the book he wrote got Mercer University kicked out of the Southern Baptist Convention. That's how, that's how um, what's the word, controversial that this book was. The main tenet of the book was that Jesus didn't have to die. That Jesus didn't have to die for us to be made right with God. Now, I have not read this book, but I can tell you right here, we've covered multiple passages tonight where Jesus said, no, 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 no must happen. He knew it must happen before he went to the cross, and after the cross he said, guys, were y'all not paying attention? This had to happen this way, because this is the only way for you to be saved. And that's where he, he, he then immediately goes into the passage we'll be studying next week, starting at John chapter 3, verse 16, most famous Bible verse in the world, but we're going to study it in context and get the full meaning of what he's talking about. That's how we'll close up with Nicodemus. Now, we are, I'm sorry, this ran all the way to 8 o'clock, but, um, so we're out of time, but do you guys have questions, thoughts, things you want to know? No, no, thanks for letting me be a part of it, and listen, and learn. Mike, I'm so glad that you're here. I really am. Now yeah, we, me too. <laughs> we, we ran off Ben, but you stayed, so you get the credit. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I stayed for him. No, I, I really appreciate it. I took a lot of notes, and uh, one thing I need to learn more is the teachings of the Bible, and that's why I've kinda, I'm trying to be better at that, because what is truth is what is right in front of us, and 
what better not to than understand it. So excellent. So that's just being honest. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, we have a yeah, group right. me group um, where we coordinate this class, and you know, here's here's when it is and where it is, and um, and I'll, I'll also be posting links to the recordings for the sessions. Uh, so yeah. if you you can have, I'll have Ben send you a link so that you can join that group me, okay. and then you can participate with us there and keep up to keep up to date. My current plan is to continue having this at seven o'clock. If that is, as long as that's still comfortable with you guys, um, that works out better for us for dinner and getting kids ready for bed and things like that. And then um, we're going to finish up uh, verse 21, hopefully next week. My plan is to finish this conversation with Nicodemus. And then I'm probably going to take a one week break because um, we've been pushing hard and I'll take a one week break and I can, sort of slow down my studying for a break and then we'll come back into it and get after it. So okay. I'd like to continue this now in the past um, when we have, cause this is a, a Wednesday night class that usually meets at church. Um, however, that may be a long time from now when we get to do that again. So I'm, I really would like to continue to do this. It gives us a chance to be together as men united over the word and not just in fellowship, cutting up and talking, but also um, this is good food for us. This is good spiritual food for us. And I don't want us to lose out on that. So I'd like to continue doing it. But after we finish this conversation with Nicodemus, I'll take a one week break and I'll coordinate all that on GroupMe. Pete, I haven't seen you in GroupMe. So um, if you need help getting into that, with your permission, I think I can just add you by adding your phone number. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in there now. You are in there? Okay, good. Yeah. Excellent. Um, for those of the, you who may not be, if you want me to just add you, if that's, if that's difficult or not working on your end, I think I can just add you by your phone number, and that'll get you in. Um, either phone number or email. So if that's the case, just tell me. You can email me or, or however you want to contact me. I'll get you in. Cool. Well, um, Dad, will you close us in prayer, and then and then we'll go go to our other things. Yeah, you're muted, Father. It's a uh, an inestimable privilege to get to know that we can get to know the things of you for the expressed purpose of having to know you more as you reinforced to me today, the more we know about you, the more we realize that we don't know about you. And it makes us hunger and thirst all the more to know you better. So that when we know you better, we love you more. And when we love you more, you lavish on us the blessedness of your abiding presence in us and thereby giving us a reward that we could not have earned and certainly had no provision to supply. Because when you give us these things, what you are giving us is yourself, which is what you started out to do to begin with. And this too is to your glory. And the more that we see that it is to your glory and not of us, the happier we are that you have drawn us into your presence, into your kingdom, into your salvation. And we are grateful that you would do it once. We are grateful for how you have spread yourself abroad among the people and brought people to yourself to bow down and to love you and to lift up our voices, our hearts, and the work of our hands to the glory of your name. So all glory be to you, O Lord our God. Be with each and all until the time that we can come back together again and learn more to love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for coming, guys. Thanks. I love Thank you, you, Scott. And I'll see you again next week. I love you, son. I love you too. Bye bye. Pa
Paul, do you want to stay on? I can. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I